just a little bit of um, review of what we, we talked about last time. And last time we went over how the methylation pattern of an animal organism is formed. And um, we saw that uh, actually the methylation pattern is erased early during embryogenesis. Erased means that whatever methylation pattern comes in with the sequence from the gametes gets erased. And then the, a new methylation pattern is established at the time of implantation. So this already gives you a feeling that, well, first of all, the, the uh, the, the methylation pattern, in essence, is not inherited. In other words, we don't inherit from our parents. So if, even if there's a change in the methylation pattern during spermatogenesis, or there's a change in the methylation pattern that occurs during orogenesis, okay, this will not be passed on to the organism. So if there's a mistake in methylation during spermatogenesis, that's not going to be passed on because it all gets erased and a new pattern is established at the time of implantation. It also tells you another piece of information, which is that since you have, since methylation is not just strictly passed on all the time, in other words, there's a stage in which you establish methylation patterns, it tells you that whatever that methylation pattern that's established has to be determined by sequence because what we are inheriting from our parents is the sequence. And so there has to be something written in the sequence that says how to create this methylation pattern. I mean, it's all got to be written in there somewhere. And we actually saw that that's the case because we tried to figure out the time of implantation, everything gets methylated, and CPG island-like sequences are protected. And we indeed saw that this protection from de novo methylation depends on what sequences are in the re those regions of the island. What makes those islands special, what makes them get protected from de novo methylation is the fact that they have certain sequences. Presumably also those sequences are recognized by some sort of factors and it's the factors that mediate this protection against de novo methylation. Uh, we're going to this is an important theme in methylation, so I'm going to go over this again with the interesting elements that have to do with it. What I want to do now is to sort of, again, focus in on this idea of de novo methylation with protection and see if we can advance a little bit more in understanding how this works. And I, I think there's a, there's a little bit of a surprise element in this as well. Uh, something that I certainly didn't expect and the students that worked on this certainly didn't expect. And it sort of um, raises all sorts of questions, but it gives you a feeling for how it occurs. So let's go into that. Okay. So it, up, in this, up until this time, we've been, really the lab had concentrated on individual sequences, individual genes, trying to learn about how, for instance, what's protected during de novo methylation. We tried to learn it by looking at a particular gene and the sequences that control that. So we looked at the APRT gene, or we looked at other genes to try and find the sequences. And of course, it's much better if you can get a global view of this because it gives you a much better feeling for what is actually protecting uh, against this de novo methylation. And so uh, basically, Ilana developed a very, very sensitive assay. Also, it turns out to be a lot of technology today to look at methylation. And uh, there's all sorts of new technologies with fancy sequencing and everything. It turns out that probably the best way at this point in history, anyhow, the best way for looking at methylation is by the technique that Ilana developed. And basically, it's based on an antibody that recognizes methyl groups. 
And uh, what you do is you take DNA. There are some regions that are methylated, some regions that are not methylated. You antibody, add the antibody, you precipitate the DNA, and isolate this DNA. And then, for instance, if you want to know what's methylated, so you take this DNA and you label it with a fluorescent dye. You take the total DNA, you label it with a fluorescent, a different color fluorescent dye, and then you put these things together on a microarray and hybridize it to all the sequences in the genome or all the CPG islands in the genome or all the promoters in the genome, whatever you want to do. And when you get more of red as opposed to yellow or even red as opposed to green, then you know that it's methylated. If you get less, it means it's unmethylated. And so um, Ilana developed this assay, and the assay actually works very well. Um, this is just really a partial picture, but it shows validation of the assay. So this is the numbers that you get out of the assay. These are called z-scores. A high z-score means it's methyl very methylated. A low z-score means that it's unmethylated. It's all based on the comparison between the precipitate the immunoprecipitated DNA as opposed to total DNA. Okay. And then it goes through all sorts of normalizations and the, the final result is a z-score. And here we've taken a whole bunch of different pieces of DNA that we've looked at and mapped their z-score as opposed to the gold standard of methylation which is bisulfite sequencing. So bisulfite sequencing, for all those of you who don't know, you take the DNA and you treat it with bisulfite. And bisulfite basically uh, doesn't do a lot to the DNA, except it takes all the C's in the DNAs and it converts them to T's. Okay? So if you would take the whole genome, you take, for instance, a bacterial genome, you treat it with bisulfite and you sequence it, you would get exactly the sequence from E. coli, let's say, but every place there would have been a C is now a T. But the trick is that 5-methyl C is not affected by bisulfite. So any place, if you do bisulfite and you find a C, you know that it was methylated. Okay? And of course, first of all, you find it all of those methylated C's are always next to G's, just as you would expect. CG is the only thing that's methylated in somatic cells. Anyhow, so you now take DNA, you sequence it, and, and we did a validation, and you can see the assay works very, very well. And there's a very good relationship between the Z-score that you get and the amount of methylation. Okay, so this, this, with this assay, you can now take a better look at this process of de novo methylation. And to do this, what we did was to, to use a microarray that has on it only CPG islands. Right. And as you'll see right now, so take a look at this blue curve. This is all the DNA in a particular cell. So you can see there's a peak of low Z-score, right? basically unmethylated. And there's a peak of high Z-score, which are probably methylated islands. So there are methylated islands. About 20-25% of the islands, or what we define as islands, are actually methylated. Okay. Notice that this curve is bimodal. Okay. So that already tells you that you always get a lot out of looking, thinking about things mathematically. So this already tells you that there's the, the methylation pattern in the genome is not, there's not a, a gradient of methylation. Right? There are th things that are allowed and things that are not allowed. And this really gives you a picture, this curve, of the process I've just been telling you about, that things get de novo methylated or they're protected. Right? It's not as if throughout the genome you can have 50%, you can have 60%, you can have 90%, you can have 20%. It doesn't work like that. There are regions that are methylated, regions that are unmethylated. Of course, there are some in between also, but basically the genome is bimodal. You see that here. These, by the way, are the CPG islands that are the promoters of housekeeping genes, and you can see they're all in the low z-scores in the unmethylated range. Okay. So 
uh, this is also an interesting thing. Again, uh, and again, I emphasize that sometimes by looking at the mathematics, you can get a lot of, a lot of things. So each one of these islands is composed of a bunch of probes on the microarray. So you can have an island, let's say, 1,000 nucleotides long. It, it can have 10 or 15 probes that are being read in that region on the microarray. And we put them all together into a z-score by averaging them. But if you look at all the individual probes, okay, so now you take all the probes in what we're calling unmethylated, all in that first curve. Okay? And now you map all the probes in, that first, in that, those unmethylated CPG islands. They're all, literally all, unmethylated. Okay? And if you take the ones out of the methylated islands, all the probes, and map them, all the probes, so there are about 10, 15 times more probes in their islands, again, you see that it's all methylated. You don't see any unmethylated probes in that group. And this tells you that the methylation pattern is really regional. That when you have a CPG ion that you're calling on methyl, it's really all unmethylated. Every place you're looking at it, it's unmethylated. So there's really a regional bimodal pattern. Um, and in actuality, we know that if this is a CPG island, the CPG island, as you saw, most of them are unmethylated. But actually, when they're unmethylated, there's a region around them of another 500, 600 nucleotides on both ends that are also unmethylated. And this is consistent with the idea that whatever is protecting the islands is protecting them on a regional basis. So within what we're calling the island, there are presumably sequences that are protecting. And these are working in a manner that's sort of regional. So that a whole region gets protected by this. So when you do this now, when you now uh, put together data from a whole bunch of different tissues, you could, because methylation basically gives you a trace, gives you a, uh, when something happens during methylation and it stays on the DNA, and then you look at it in the tissue, it sort of gives you a picture, a past picture of the, of the developmental events. Okay? And you can see that here on a very, very simple basis. We looked for all the CPG islands that are unmethylated in every tissue. These are brain samples, liver samples, muscle samples, colon, blood. These are ES cells, sperm. Okay? And there are about 13,000 CPG islands that look like this. Green means unmethylated. That means in the first peak. And red means methylated, means in the second peak that you saw. Um, so it's clear, they're unmethylated in every tissue, it's clear that these are sequences that were recognized at the time of implantation, were protected, didn't get methylated, and then because there's maintenance methylase, it remained that way. And as a result, a, 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 a big event happened at the beginning of development that's now reflected in every tissue. And, and here are the methylated islands. So it turns out there are about 2,500 islands that are methylated. So, so what's happening here is that the, the definition of island that people have been using wasn't exactly correct in terms of methylation. There's something about those sequences. They're not protected. And they sort of represent the rest of the genome for us. In other words, they don't have any mechanism to protect them. So it's like the rest of the genome. The sequences look very much like islands. They have a lot of CGs, but obviously they don't have the right sequences to make them protected. And again, you see, in all the tissues there, they're methylated. Again, you can look at this developmentally. This looks like this because at the time of implantation, there was methylation, and then it just got carried on to the rest of the tissues. Okay. So then, this is a, a lot of this work was done by Ravid, Ravid Straussman. Ravid went to a whole bunch of databases, and he looked up in these CPG islands where they're located, all these thousands of CPG islands, where they're located with reference to transcription start sites, or we can call them promoters. 
Okay? And you see the following. So this is based on thousands and thousands of CPG islands, their methylation data. Again, this is z-score. High z-score is methylated. Low z-score is unmethylated. And this is the transcription start site. And you can see around the transcription start site, CPG islands are unmethylated. So CPG islands that are located near transcription start sites or, or surrounding C transcription start sites are unmethylated. As soon as you start going away from there, all the CPG islands are, are, are methylated. Okay. So there's something about a transcription start site that has to do with protection. Okay. We already saw that, or if you remember when we looked at the model of the APRT gene, we already saw the SP1, which is associated with transcription, is an important factor pr for protecting CPG islands. And now we see it on a global scale, that there's something about transcription start sites, not necessarily actively being transcribed. There's something about these positions in the genome that leaves these regions protected at the time of implantation. And you can see that here as well. If you now do sort of the opposite converse experiment, okay, you take all of the CPG islands that are located near transcription start sites from the beginning. Okay, and you ask, what are their z-scores? So their z-scores look like this. You don't see any over here. They're all low. They're all unmethylated. And now you take all of the CPG islands that are far away from transcription start sites, and you ask what are their z-scores, you see they're all methylated. Okay. So there really is a very good correlation. And Ravid put together a, a bunch of about 1,000 different CPG islands that are very, very similar in terms of the parameters that people use to define CPG islands. Right. So, so he took about 1,000 different islands that were either constitutively unmethylated, and they're all green, or constitutively methylated, all red. Okay. And he, he chose them so they have approximately the same length. They have the same amount of GC percent. These are all things that go into defining a CPG island. Observed over expected CPG content, they're identical. Right? But these are unmethylated, and these are methylated. Right? So th they look identical in terms of these criteria. The, he then looked at a database that tells you something about histone modification, and it turns out that these CPG islands are associated with trimethylated lysine 4, which is a very, uh, 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 a modification is very, very closely associated with promoters, with active promoters. Okay? And you can see almost all of these unmethylated ones are associated with this lysine 4. Okay? And literally none of the methylated ones. Zero, zero, zero. There's one out of 2,000 and some, one out of 1,000. Okay. Okay. So again, this again gives a hint that what's determining whether it's unmethylated has something to do with the beginning of transcription. And so uh, Ravid said, okay, we know, as I mentioned before, this has to be dependent on sequence. Right, something There has to be, even if we don't understand the intermediate steps of the mechanism, it has to be dependent on sequence. Right? Because it's erased beforehand. You reset it, got to be sequenced somewhere along the line. So he started looking for sequences that would distinguish between the unmethylated islands and the methylated islands. Okay? And indeed, using all sorts of um, you know, programs, bioinformatic programs, he came up with sequences that are found in the unmethylated islands, but not found, or found at a very, very, very low rate in the methylated islands. And here are some of them. There are about 26 of these sequences. These are the six most prominent. And indeed, some of them are sites for transcription factors, which strengthens this idea about transcription. When I was at the Weizmann Institute, Naama Barkai came over to me and for those of you who don't know who she is, she's a very, very wonderful computational biologist at the Weizmann Institute. And she said to me, you, you, you don't show things like this. P-value of sure. 10 to the minus 300. 
he said, she said to me, this is obvious. <laughs> you don't need a p-value. <laughs> and, and, and it's really true. <laughs> But I'm sure if we sent it to a journal without the p-value, it would come back. <laughs> OK. So then, the, in, in, after looking for sequences that characterize the unmethylated as averse to the meth, this, you see, this, this experiment gave us a real fantastic tool. By looking at all the islands in the genome, and islands are, are generally close to each other in, in sequence. They're not far away. And coming up with 2,000 that are methylated and a bunch of thousands that are unmethylated gave us a fantastic tool for figuring out what are the sequences that are involved in bringing about protection. Because we had something to compare, something very close to compare. Okay? And indeed, uh, Ravi took advantage of this and developed an algorithm, again, by using bioinformatics types program, to try and predict in the genome, uh, what would remain unmethylated? If you know, if you can do this, it's a real proof that it really has to do with sequence. If you can predict a priori a sequence is unmethylated, right? It means that okay, you know the trick, you know the secret. The secret's in the sequence. And indeed, he succeeded in doing this. These are all, as you can see, you know, if you just based on CPG observed over expected, which is one of the major definitions of a CPG island. You get a curve like this, which means that when you're getting 50% or when you're getting 90% positives, you're right 90% of the time, but you're wrong 50% of the time. That's not very good. Okay. But using Ravid's algorithm, he got up to something like 92 or 93% right. And at that rate, only about 7% wrong, 6 to 7% wrong. A wonderful. And, and, and this can actually be refined even better. Not only that, but on the basis of this algorithm, you can then go back to the genome. Okay? So up until now, we've only been basing everything on CPG islands on the microarray. You go back to the genome and you say, are there more of these sequences? And sure enough, there are about 4,000 more sequences that fit the algorithm. And then you can go and test them, either by bisulfite or by doing a microarray. And sure enough, they're constitutively unmethylated. So it, it really works. And it's really this whole building of the methylation pattern is based on sequence. OK, so we, we think we don't know. But we think that the way you generate the CPG island, the protection of CPG island, the way you develop it, the, the overall methylation pattern of the genome it is based on something that has to do with transcription. We don't know exactly what. We don't know exactly how it works. But we think that what happens is, is the follows, following. That at the time, during the blastula, in the blastula, everything's been unmethylated. Okay? There are sequences on the DNA which are used for binding RNA polymerase or somehow starting the process of or bringing something that's associated with RNA polymerase, maybe making the DNA, giving it histones, um, methylated K4 histones. But there are sequences that encourage this. Some of them are SP1. Some of them we saw other sequences. And these encourage the binding, perhaps, of RNA polymerase. And then, so this is in the blastula. So in the blastula, basically, where RNA polymerase binds is dependent on sequence information, just like it is in an organism that doesn't have methylation. Right? It's sort of like, like it would be in, ye in yeast or it would be in bacteria. Okay? And then at the time of implantation, in an event that is unique to animals, okay, you get de novo methylation. And there's something about this region that protects. So it's somehow based on the presence of RNA polymerase or the factors that are con connected with RNA. We don't know exactly. This, this can be tested, though. OK. Now, um, 
I want to talk a little bit now about this concept of erasure. Okay. Uh, I, I think it's a very interesting concept in bio the biology of man or the bi biology of animals. Uh, what I'm going to say now, I, remember, I mentioned before that another organism that is characterized by a lot of methylation is plants. Okay. But what I'm going to show you now doesn't happen in plants. Okay. okay. So, there are a whole bunch of sequences in the genome, in the human genome, uh, 1,500 of them, to be more precise, that give you this pattern when you look at different tissues. Okay, so you remember red is methylated, green is unmethylated. So the 1,500 sequences that are methylated throughout the genome, throughout the organism, again, brain, liver, muscle, colon, blood, Right? But in sperm, they're unmethylated. So you ask yourself, how does this pattern come about? How does, how does this work? Where, where does it come from? Okay. And actually, there are two possibilities. And we don't know what the right possibility is. So it's a possibility one is the following. That let's start off with implantation. Okay, well, we start off with the blastula, everything we presume is unmethylated. Implantation looks like it's recognized as a non-island. In other words, it gets methylated. It doesn't have the sequences to protect. Okay? And then what happens? So you have implantation. After implantation, you have the, the germline is derived. Okay? So it looks like one possibility is the germline is derived and this, the cells go through the germline, and at some point during spermatogenesis, uh, you get specific demethylation of genes that are involved in spermatogenesis. In, in fact, a large number of the CPG islands that are at promoters have to do with spermatogenesis. That's true. Okay. So that could explain this pattern. Okay. Another way of explaining the pattern is the following. It turns out that, and, and you actually saw this in one of our slides that we, from work of Tal Kafri from uh, 20 years ago, that during uh, gametogenesis, there's another round of erasure. So a cell that starts off from implantation goes into the process of gametogenesis, is, is methylated, but then it undergoes global demethylation, and then the methylation is established again. So it's possible that this is some sort of protection. In other words, during gametogenesis or spermatogenesis, you went through a total demethylation. Then there's a process of de novo methylation again. And it could be that in addition to the, all the other sequences that are protected, these sequences are also protected. We don't know. We don't know what the mechanism is. It could be this, it could be that. But one thing is clear, and that is that at the time of implantation, these sequences are recognized as to be methylated. They're not protected. Okay? There's another, uh, this is post-implantation. Oh, sorry, I gave away the secret. Okay. Uh, there's another group of CPG islands, right? that were selected from all the CPG islands on the basis of the fact that they're specifically methylated in one tissue. Okay? So you can see these sequences, there they must be about 30 or 40 of them, they're methylated in brain but not methylated anywhere else. These sequences are methylated in liver but not methylated anywhere else. And, and you can see there are sequences in, that are methylated in sperm, not methylated anywhere else. Okay, so how does this come about? How, what's, the, what's the developmental history of this? What's the tracing history of this? Okay. So, again, I think it's clear. That is, that at the time of implantation, these sequences are protected. And that's why in most tissues, they're unmethylated. And we're not looking at all tissues. There are another 40, 50, if you take the brain, could be another 100, 200 tissue types in there. 
They're, they're basically all unmethylated. Right? So at the time of implantation, they're protected. They're, they're protected. They don't undergo de novo methylation. And then they have to go undergo de novo methylation specifically in the tissue, in specific tissue. Okay? And as we mentioned before, something like this, again, is not global methylation. There has to be something that brings the methylation specifically to those CPG <coughs> islands. There's a different process of methylation. Not what we've been talking about before, not a global mechanism. It has to be something specific. Because only specific CPG islands do it. Okay? As soon as you have specificity, it's not global. Okay. okay. So now, this is just this, a lot of times in order to make sure this is right, you do bisulfite analysis to make sure it's right. So for instance here, these sequ this sequence, this specific sequence was found methylated, red means methylated here, in all these molecules in the brain, a specific gene, but in other tissues it was unmethylated. And these, this particular CPG island was found methylated in liver, but not methylated in other tissues. Okay, so this brings me to the subject of Dolly. Okay. So you all know how, wh wh who Dolly is, or was. Uh, she was formed by taking a somatic cell from an uh, udder of a um, sheep and transplanting it into a fertilized oocyte. And the fertilized oocyte first had its genetic material removed, okay? and the nucleus from the somatic cell replaced that genetic material. So you now have a cell, which instead of being immediately formed by genetic information from the mother and father, now has already packaged into one nucleus information from a mother and father together. Okay? And then this organism developed into Dolly. Okay? So in order for this to happen, in order for this to work, okay, there has to be, I think, I think this is sort of the concept of Dolly. And, and you'll see at the level of, when you look at it from the point of view of methylation, you understand this. Okay? And that is, in order to do this, you have to be able to erase the epigenetic marks that are in the somatic cell. You have to go back to zero. You have to go back to the tabula rosa, right? To the beginning. And so there has to be there's some sort of erasure mechanism, erasure press. And methylation which may not be the entire story, I have no idea, but certainly fits this concept. Because if we now think to ourselves what happens to the DNA of this nucleus in the evolution of Dali, right, from the oocyte and from the fertilized oocyte goes on and it's going to undergo massive de novo methylation automatically. Okay? That's part of the process. And so the, you see this erasure and then the reestablishment. And uh, in fact, we know, you know that when, when uh, they did this experiment, they did this experiment with Dolly 346 times. And there was only one Dolly. Dolly won and that's it. And uh, we now know in experiments from other animals that the ones that don't make it, that get stopped along the way, there are always problems with methylation. Something didn't go right in the demethylation. Okay? And so this demethylation is an important thing. Now, so why, so, but, but that's an artificial experiment. Why does this exist in the organism? So I think we can now, from that, if we look at it that way, we can understand it. Because let's go back now to this. So first of all, these sequences. Okay, what, what's happening with these sequences? These sequences are unmethylated in sperm. Okay, and are methylated at the time of implantation. 
Okay? So now you can understand this de novo methylation. From the point of view of these sequences, this de novo methylation is very, very important. Because the DNA that comes from the sperm is unmethylated. Okay? So if, the, if there was no process of erasure and rebuilding, here you don't need erasure, but you need the rebuilding. Right? You wouldn't be able to generate, to take the sperm and erase it, but literally erase what happened during spermatogenesis. Okay? So this erasure and rebuilding enables that. And of course, this de novo methylation in sperm okay, gets erased at the time of the early pre-implantation embryo. Right? And then is protected at the time of de novo methylation. Okay? So you need, the, you need the process as well to erase, and then at the time of implantation it's not methylated so it gets protected. Okay, so basically we, uh, every organ, every one of us undergoes the same process that, of Dolly every time, except that it's not, not a somatic cell, but it's a gametic cell. And the same reprogramming that we're always talking about of somatic cells basically occurs during every, the generation of every individual. But it's re reprogramming of the gametic cells in order to make the organism. Okay. So that's Dolly. Okay, now I want to get into uh, the role of methylation. And, and, and one of the reasons I want to do this is because I think I've already mentioned this, there's a lot of controversy. Maybe not a lot of controversy, but there is controversy about the role of methylation. This arose, this controversy arose because many times you, you take a look at a system and you see there's no methylation there. The gene gets turned on, the gene gets turned off, and there's no change in methylation. So how does methylation play a role? Right? Or the opposite, sometimes you see something that's methylated, and it gets turned on, and it looks like methylation doesn't have anything to do with it. And, 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 and so this has brought about sort of questions about methylation. Another source of problem um, basically comes from a few people, but one in particular, Mark Ptashny. Mark Ptashny, I'm sure you all know his name, is very, very, he's basically the the person who developed the whole concept of the, the repressor in bacteria. Okay? And the whole idea afterwards of about how factors control uh, RNA transcription in bacteria. Okay? And so Mark says the following. He says, methylation, it, you don't need it. Everything is controlled by factors. Everything's controlled by factors. You want to turn on a gene, you have a factor that recognizes the gene and turns it on. You ha want to turn off a gene, you have a factor that recognizes the gene and turns it off. Okay? So you might see methylation there in correlation, but methylation itself can't be specific. Right? If methylation's on the gene, when we saw there was de novo methylation here, right? you can't just get tissue-specific, gene-specific de novo methylation without something directing the methylation to there. There has to be a factor involved. Or to, you take off the methylation of a tissue-specific gene, you have to recognize it. Right? So, in a sense, Mark is right. So what, what is the role of methylation? And we, we cope with this all the time. I mean, cope with it in an honest way, trying to understand what is the basic role of methylation in the uh, ontology of the, uh, of the organism? Okay? So we already talked about one aspect of it. We said that this de novo methylation at the time of implantation serves as a global mechanism for methylating almost the entire re genome, and, and that helps keep rep the transcription down. Okay? This is, I think, an important concept. It's very, very hard to prove it. 
And we saw that it works in mouse, that you can make a transgenic animal that's either methylated or unmethylated, and we saw it works. But, you know, is methylation doing this? Is it really important? What would happen if it weren't the case? Okay. So we sort of know a little bit about that, and that is that if you take a, make a mouse that doesn't have methylation, you take away its maintenance methylase, or you take away its de novo methylase early on, right? these mice can't survive. They, they can live as ES cells, but they can't make an organism. So methylation is important. But a knockout experiment like that doesn't help you very much because it could be that the knockout of the DNMT, of the methylase, affects one gene, or two genes, or four genes. And not the way I present it, that it keeps the level of transcription down. It's a hard, hard concept to prove. Right? I, I think it's true, and it, it makes a lot of sense, but it's a hard concept to prove. OK. So I want to show you this experiment. This is an experiment that was done by Yehudit, Yehudit and, and myself, and, the, and, and, and Yerit, and who else took part in this? A lot of people. So, uh, Silvina. And, w w and what, what we did was we looked at the uh, turning off of OCT4. OCT4 is a gene that's present in early development, is expressed in early development, and it's necessary for pluripotency. For cells to be pluripotent, they have to express OCT4. Following implantation in the mouse, OCT4 gets turned off. And then cells are no longer pluripotent. Okay? So what Yehudi and I did was to look at how OCT4 gets turned off from the point of view of transcription, chromatin, and methylation. Okay? So this is a depiction of OCT4. And this is a cartoon of OCT4 for people who are interested in chromatin and methylation. So this is the gene. These are the CPGs. They're unmethylated in early embryo. We used ES cells as a model, but I'm not so sure that makes any difference because this process also occurs this way in vivo. OK, so we have a, um, the DNA. It's unmethylated, the OCT4 gene. And it's packaged in histones. And the histones are acetylated. Lysine 4 is methylated. It's in an active chromatin conformation. It's an active methylation conformation, and it's active transcriptionally. How does it get turned off? First step, chromatin is open, methylation is open. Some sort of factor comes along and turns off the transcription of OCT4. Right? Recognize the gene. You have to recognize the gene. You turn off transcription. Classic bacterial repression. First step. Okay. Second step. Second step is that a, a protein, G9A, which is a histone methylase, gets recruited to here. How does it get recruited? Again, there has to be some sort of factor that recruits it. Okay. Specific. All this is specific. It gets recruited. It brings along a histone deacetylase. And then these two machines start working. They deacetylate. There's a, so it must be an enzyme, we don't know what it is yet, that demethylates lysine 4. So what have we done up till now? We've generated, we've taken away the active marks of the histones. Okay? So it's no longer active chromatin, but it's not yet heterochromatin. What makes it heterochromatin, or closed chromatin, is that G9A is a methylase, and it methylates lysine 9. Methylated lysine 9 attracts what's known as hetero, heterochromatin protein 1. Okay. Now we've generated what's known as heterochromatin. If you look, for instance, in the centromeric region of the of chromosomes, you'll find it's characterized by this structure. This is what we call heterochromatin. Chromatin that's been heterochromatized basically by this protein, by, by this protein. Right? Puts it in a, a closed form. So, first step, turn off transcription. Second step, 
make a closed chromatin. It's still unmethylated. Okay? But now it turns out that G9A, G9A is a whole organism in and of itself. Right? First of all, it brings the acetylase. Second of all, it causes this methylation. And now I'm going to tell you that G9A has the ability to attract a de novo methylase. Same machine. And then you get methylation of the gene. Okay? So, indeed, OCT4 undergoes methylation, but it looks like it, it's insignificant. You've already turned off, basic, the, the basic process of turning off OCT has nothing to do either with chromatin or with methylation. It has to do with a factor that turns off the gene, it turns off the transcription, just like Mark Tashney says. Okay? Okay. So then, Yudi and I asked quest more developmentally oriented questions. Okay? And we basically asked, what is the significance of methylation in terms of how strong this in inactivation is? How strong is it? How stable is it? Okay? And, and so we did the following experiment. We took cells, ES cells, and uh, we uh, differentiated them. Okay. And then took the differentiated cells and put them back in the media, the medium, culture medium, that encourages stem cellness, pluripotency. Okay? So if you do that with wild type cells, okay, you differentiate them, and then ask how many go back, when you put them back into culture medium that encourages stemness, how many grow? Very few. Okay? I mean, a wild type cell that undergoes differentiation, it's not capable of going back. It doesn't like to go back. Okay? If you take cells that don't have G9A, that's this machine that not only makes heterochromatin, but also does de novo methylation, right? They start coming back. In other words, if you don't have the methylation, if you don't have the chromatin, it's not so stable. The gene got turned off, but it's reversible. And that makes sense. I mean, that's the way transcription factors work. Right? At one point, it's there, the, the repressor is there, right? And then later the repressor can go away and the repressor can come back. It's dynamic, okay? But if you have methylation and chromatin, not so easy to do. Okay, this just shows that if you now take the same G9A minus cells and you give it back a transgene with G9A, it converts to the wild type form. In other words, it now can't go back. If you just take away the methylation by getting rid of the de novo methylase, it can come back. Okay? So it looks like methylation is the important thing. In other words, here, and we looked at this, it still forms the heterochromatin. The DNMT3A B minus still forms heterochromatin. Right? But it can come back. Heterochromatin itself doesn't protect. So neither the factor alone nor the heterochromatin alone protects. Right? And then just to, I, we really don't have to do this, but just for completion, um, this you've already seen. This is a strain, G9A minus. We've given it a transgene, given it back the tran a transgene with G9A that lacks, has a mutation in the set domain. It can't methylate chromatin. Can't methylate. But it can still bring the de novo methylase. Okay? These don't reconvert because they're still methylating. They're not making the heterochromatin, but they're methylating. They can't go back. If you now make a G9A, and take a, a transgenic G9A that now has lost the ability to attract the de novo methylase, they go back. So 
it's clear that methylation has a role here. It's not, it doesn't have a role in turning off OCT4. It's only secondary in turning off OCT4. But it has a role in preserving it, preserving this state. Okay? And put that together with the idea that methylation has an autonomous mechanism for being conserved through cell generation, from generation to generation to generation, you have a mechanism for stability. Okay? In a long living organism like man or a mouse or an elephant, this is important. It's important to be able to have stable repression. Okay, so this is just a, to remind me to tell you, to give you a feeling. Again, these are open questions, but we can get a feeling for it. Okay? So wh where's, where can we see where methylation plays a role? Uh, first of all, there are a whole bunch of endogenous viruses in the genome. Okay? As I almost can tell you, every place you go, you find them. Most of these endogenous viruses get methylated at the time of implantation. In other words, their promoters are not protected. So together with the rest of the genome, they're getting de novo methylated. And this is a mechanism, basically, for turning off endogenous viruses in the genome. It's a global mechanism for turning off endogenous viruses in the genome. And we know that this is the case because we know that uh, when you make, a, when you take a look at DNMT minus ES cells that are differentiating just at the time of differentiation, right, without DNMT, all the viral sequences start expressing. Okay. So this is one thing that methylation does. It, it keeps down parasitic DNA. Another place where DNA methylation plays a role is inactivation of the X chromosome in females. Again, when you inactivate the X chromosome at the time of just before implantation, methylation doesn't do that. There are at least four or five steps that precede the de novo methylation, and de novo methylation only occurs very late in the process. The inactivation itself occurs by all sorts of other mechanisms. But it's the methylation that keeps it stable. Okay? As an example, the kangaroo. The kangaroo, uh, marsupials in general, they also have X inactivation. Their X inactivation, first of all, it's always paternal. The maternal chromosome gets inactivated in females. Uh, but and they don't methylate. They do the inactivation, they don't methylate. And sure enough, you see, if you take big kangaroos, adult kangaroos, all, a lot of these X chromosome genes start getting reactivated. What, something that you never see in man. They're closed, they're turned off, they never get reactivated. You know, one in 10 to the eighth cells. And here they get they, they estimated that in an adult kangaroo, about 30% of the inactive X gets Reactivated. Right? So clearly DNA methylation is playing a role here. Imprinting genes that are active on the maternal gene alone or on the paternal gene alone, they all have methylation, which again distinguishes between two alleles. So it's clear you can't have something like X chromosome inactivation or imprinting in a cell without having cis acting mechanisms like methylation or something else. Okay? Because you have the same factors in the cell. Okay? You can't blame it on something in trans. Okay? So Mark would say, Mark is the devil's advocate here, he would say that you can explain these things on the basis of loops, of protein loops, that, so, by the idea of cooperativity. Once you have a protein factor bound here, okay, so now you replicate the cell, and because there's some of that factor there, it'll attract more of that factor. On the other allele, you didn't have that, and that, so that won't happen. So by cooperative, um, cooperative interactions, you can explain allelic transcription. Okay. But 
Methylation works a lot better, <laughs> as we all know. All, all of these mechanisms are loose. They don't, they don't work 100%. Methylation is a very strong mechanism. If it would work only by operation, if you do the novel, if you force the, the system to go through demethylation, the operation should, should go away. Right. Go away, but you don't, you see that That's right. Corrupt. Exactly right. Yeah. This is, okay. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here. Um, just one more, one more thought. And that is that um, I want to go back to what we started with. There's, there's one more concept I want to bring about methylation, which I'm going to bring at, in the next lecture. But before that, I want to just go back to how we started off. If you remember, we started off with these sort of Mickey Mouse experiments that we did 30-something years ago on DNA sensitivity and accessibility. And the, the concept there, and I think it's still the concept today, is that in, an, in animal organisms, what controls expression is basically accessibility. Right? You need transacting factors, you need specific factors, but what really controls whether a gene is going to be active or inactive, or how much it's going to be active or inactive, to a large extent has to do with its accessibility in the genome. That's the way the animal genome is built. Okay? So if we now ask about um, factors, okay? so we know that there are factors that um, can affect chromatin structure. There are factors that can acetylate, deacetylate histones, methylate histones, ubiquitinate histones, Phosphorylate histones. What am I missing? What did I forget? I don't know. What? Adenylation. Aden well, maybe adenylation of histones. Okay. So these things, as factors, have direct effects on um, on the chromatin structure, and they they work by opening or closing chromatin structure. I think you have to look at methylation from that point of view also. Methylation itself okay, is, is not really, does not really affect gene expression. It's the effect of methylation on chromatin structure. Everything gets mediated through chromatin structure. And methylation works that way as well. And, and the reason I'm bringing it up now is because next time we're going to try and talk about another epigenetic mechanism that has to do with replication timing. And you'll see the same thing is true there, that probably replication timing affects gene expression, not because of replication timing, but because of what it does to chromatin structure. So everything gets funneled through chromatin structure. Factors work through chromatin structure. Methylation works through chromatin structure. Okay, till the next time. Thank you very much.